active protection, its future and its past. A very interesting topic brought front and center by the conflict in Ukraine, where hundreds, possibly thousands, of Soviet-era tanks have been turned unceremoniously so into Soviet-era scrap. Which in turn raise a lot of questions, mostly bad ones, about the validity of tanks on the modern battlefield. Now, I have already talked about that topic in a separate video, explaining that this is not a tank issue, but a lethality issue, which affects damn near every branch of the military to some degree or another. But in the eternal race between the sword and the shield, there is always a response. And the tank's response to the anti-tank guided missile is the active protection system, its many guises and shapes. Indeed, the active protection system in the modern meaning of the word, like for example the Russian Arena or the Israeli Iron Fist, are merely the latest iterations on a long series of active tank defenses. Active as in a system on the tank or activated by the tank that tries to intercept or confuse incoming munitions or alternatively conceal the tank's position via active measures, for example, smoke grenades. Simple, good old fashioned smoke. Well, not quite, but we'll get to that in a moment. For it might sound almost archaic in comparison to modern active kill systems that literally shoot down incoming missiles, and <laughs> it is, I suppose. But an effective smoke screen can provide the best protection imaginable, namely, not getting hit in the first place. Now, even the humble smoke grenade has undergone some pretty drastic changes. Today, they can, for example, be linked to a laser detection system on the tank's hull. This system's job, as the name implies, is to detect whenever the tank is being hit by a laser, as this usually indicates that something very negative is going on, like, for example, that an enemy tank is painting your hull with its range-finding laser, in preparations to fire its gun at you, or if you are being targeted by a laser guidance system from incoming munitions. Regardless of which one it is, being painted by a laser in wartime is bad news. And so the system is connected to a series of smoke grenades on the tank's hull that are automatically fired in response to the threat. These smoke grenades then explode, covering the tank in a shroud of not just regular old smoke, but rather burning phosphorus, carbon fibers, glass fibers, and metallic chaff particles to create a screen that blocks laser, radar, infrared, and thermal imaging. Pretty cool, right? However, this system has been around for a while, and countermeasures to the countermeasure has already been created. Let's take the British slash Swedish N law of recent fame, for example. It functions by essentially taking a picture of the target, estimating range, speed, atmospherics, etc., etc., and then fires the missile not towards the target, not guided by the operator or the launcher towards the tank, but rather the missile simply flies towards where it thinks the tank will be in however many seconds until impact. In other words, you can conceal yourself as much as you want, the missile's just going to keep going straight, and <laughs> man. The irony is not lost on me, that after stacking sensors upon sensors, guidance system upon guidance system, we have finally returned back to, eh, just kind of guess where the thing's gonna be and shoot. <laughs> Granted, it is a far more sophisticated computer-generated guess, but a guess nevertheless. Still, the development of sensor blocking smoke and smoke in general is one early example of active protection that was developed for the exact same reasons why we are working on shooting down anti-tank guided missiles today. Because the tanks are vulnerable to anti-tank weapons, as they have always been and always will be to greater or lesser degrees. The very first tanks deployed in World War I were countered in an improvised fashion by simply pointing artillery at them and firing massive-ass HE shells over open sights. 
It did wonders against tanks like the Mark I and II, since the riveted armor plating turned out to be a lethal design flaw, as when struck by a sufficiently tremendous outside force, the rivets would be de facto fired in reverse into the tank, much to the detriment of its poor occupants at the time. The solution then was simple. Better armor, thicker armor, less rivets. And if you wanted to be really fancy, you would even round the armor as on the Soviet T-34. For a while, that was the way of things. AT was a bigger gun. The 37mm became the 50, the 50 became the 88, and the 88 became the 128, whilst the tank's response was equally simple. The Panzer II had 15mm of armour, the King Tiger had 185. The way things were going, we would eventually end up with enormous rumbling land fortresses like the Ratte. <laughs> now that would have been cool, but... The Germans, as always, had to ruin the fun with the introduction of widespread and effective shaped charge weaponry, a variant of which was first used in combat against the littoral fortress of Eben Amel in Belgium, and later in the form of the Panzer Schreck and the Panzer Faust. Suddenly, AT munitions penetration was measured in the hundreds of millimeters and was fired not by an enormous anti-tank gun weighing tons, but rather by a single dude in a bush with a tube. The reason for this was the aforementioned shaped charge, which is a very simple concept first discovered in the late 1700s and then refined and effectivized with the invention of better high explosives. Put simply, when something explodes, it produces an outwards force. This force will go in every direction possible, up, down, left, right, etc., thereby dispersing the total force of the blast. If, however, you put the explosives inside of a container with only one opening, the majority of the force will naturally go out the opening, part of least resistance, thereby in turn increasing the blast force of the explosives. This was then further enhanced by the addition of a liner, which is usually a thin conical shaped layer of metal inside the weapon. When the explosives go boom, the shape of the container and the liner works together to exert the maximum force to compress and propel the liner out of the weapon. When done correctly, this creates a jet stream of hypersonic liquefied metal. <laughs> with some modern variants capable of propelling the jet at 10 kilometers per second. And surprisingly, um, this makes a complete mockery of most regular armor. And so, the true arms race began. One early countermeasure was spaced armor, in the form of the German tank skirts and side armor plating, which would detonate the projectile and disperse the jet before it actually got to the hull. However, the main limitations on shaped charge weaponry was range. The Panzer Schreck had a maximum effective range of 150 meters, the American Bazooka a little less, and the Soviet RPG-2 about the same as the Schreck. 150 meters is not a lot in warfare terms, especially not versus a tank with two 3 machine guns and a 100 plus millimeter gun with HE rounds. The anti-tank soldier's only hope was to remain hidden until the tank got within that magical 150 meters, and preferably a lot closer than that again too, to make sure of a kill shot. This meant that a tank operating in cooperation with infantry could very easily maintain a security perimeter around it. Whenever the infantry ran into enemy infantry, they'd have a tank 100 odd meters behind them, capable of laying into the enemy with its cannons and machine guns. The primary solution, therefore, to the early shaped charges was a tactical one close cooperation with infantry. A valuable tactical doctrine that has been seemingly forgotten even by some modern armies as well. But it is a bit more difficult today because in the mid-1950s the French introduced this absolutely adorable little thing. The SS-10, the world's first guided anti-tank missile. Now its performance was uh, 
so-and-so. It was used during the Suez Crisis to some effect, but it quickly became obvious that manually guided missiles like this required a very skilled and very calm operator. And even then, the missile usually missed. But the SS-10 had a range of up to 1.5 kilometers immediately complicating the previous tactical solution to shape charges. The weapons only got better from there. During the Yom Kippur War, a key part of the Egyptian strategy was to stop Israeli army in the vast open areas of the Sinai Peninsula. And to do this, they relied upon the Soviet-produced 9M14 Malyutka, Maklos missile, that being manual command to line-of-sight missile. For the Malayutka, this meant that it was a wire-guided missile, so the weapon has a little wire trailing behind it as it flies, which is connected in turn to a command console, allowing the operator to literally steer the missile onto target. The Malayutka also had a range of up to 3 kilometers and could easily defeat any armor on the Israeli side. And that it did as well. The Israeli armor suffered badly during the initial engagements as they had no purpose-built countermeasures. Though in time, the Israelis did come up with an improvised one at least. As mentioned, the Malayurka could be manually guided onto target. Conversely, this also meant it had to be manually guided onto target by a soldier within visual range of the tank. And so the Israeli solution was as beautiful as it was simple. The moment a tank within a formation spotted the huge glowing fireball light of the missile's propulsion, also kicking up an enormous fume of sand behind it, he would shout out the direction of the radio, and every tank would start hosing down the area with every machine gun in hand. 9 to 12 tanks, 2 to 3 machine guns each, many, many, many bullets. And the Egyptian ATGM team would need some seriously hairy balls to remain composed and continue guiding the weapon. In most cases, being on the receiving end of a few hundred thousand rounds per minute tended to see the crew prioritize their own safety over hitting the enemy. But. Better answers had to be found, and in 1982, just in time for the Lebanon War, Israeli tanks were fitted with explosive reactive armor. This was another originally Soviet invention from the 60s, and the first true example of a purpose-built hard-kill countermeasure system, where the projectile itself would be attacked and defeated rather than a soft-kill system, where the weapon's sensors would be jammed or disturbed or the target otherwise hidden from view. Now, explosive reactive armor, or ERA, is, as the name suggests, armor that explodes. <laughs> Which might not immediately sound like all that good of an idea, but the ERA, of course, is mounted on the outside of the proper armor in these pretty little boxes, as many of you will probably have seen on Soviet and Russian tanks. The principle is quite simple. You take a slab of high explosives and then sandwich it in between a pair of metal plates. When hit by the hyperheated and fast-moving jet from the shaped charge, the explosives do what explosives usually do when exposed to ridiculous heat. Go boom. But this time, all of the energy is directed outwards, since the tank behind the era is, of course, not going to be moving. All of the force, the metal plate and the explosive effect moves outwards and upwards, which in turn helps to disperse the liquid metal jet and deflect the missile. There are uh, more advanced versions of this too, of course, but the basic principle remains the same. At first, this proved to be very effective, tremendously so, and threatened to render the shaped charge weapons near obsolete. At least you would need multiple hits on a target to peel away all of the era first. And that was when a smart-ass American said, but wait, what if we make two explosive charges? And so, the Toe 2 was born, or more precisely, the 
Tandem Warhead. You can see it here on this RPG-9, where a smaller charge is mounted to the tip of the weapon. This would hit and detonate the era, and then break away, leaving the real charge coming on hot behind it, ready to break through the tank's now exposed main hull armor. This was in turn countered by attempting to make Ira with multiple plates, but at the moment, with ever better shaped charges and guidance systems that no longer require an active operator to steer the missile, the balance has tipped decisively in favor of the ATGM. Which finally gets us to the juicy bits, modern hard kill systems. Because if no amount of armor can save you, what do you do? You shoot the damn missile to pieces before it can hit you. Now, this is a somewhat um, temperamental solution. Many countries are working on their own versions, but as it turns out, it is kinda hard to shoot down a missile moving at a couple hundred meters per second at the very least, to do it reliably. For example, we have the Chinese GL-5 Active Protection, which kills the incoming missile with two little baby missiles of its own. Meanwhile, the Israeli Trophy System essentially fires a shotgun at the incoming weapon. Regardless of the variant, the idea is the same. For more detail, um, let's look at the Russian Arena system as uh, that is currently quite relevant, which pointedly we have seemingly not seen deployed in Ukraine at the moment, which is um, rather interesting and may suggest that it is not quite as effective as it is supposed to be. Anywho, the history of the arena system dates all the way back to 1977, when the Soviet Union was the first in the world to start work on an active protection hard kill system designed to shoot and destroy incoming HEAT weapons, HEAT. This system's name was Drozd, and about two, 250 systems were produced and deployed to the Soviet Union's then ongoing war in Afghanistan for field testing, where local guerrillas had proven to be quite adept at turning Soviet-made RPGs back onto their previous masters. The systems were installed on T-55 AD tanks, serving alongside elite naval infantry formations and had quite some success in the field. Consisting of a radar and two sets of 407mm HE frag launchers mounted on either side of the turret, <laughs> basically a quad barreled 107mm shotguns, <laughs> which is both a frightening and mildly arousing thought, I must admit, <clears throat> where the idea was that the radar detects the incoming weapon, which it could do up to a range of 150 meters, and then the radar would point the closest set of launchers towards it and fire. Simple, yet very effective, as the system was estimated to have about a 70% success rate. Not bad at all for a first try, but there were of course a few minor itsy bitsy problems. One, the system was massive, about a ton's worth of stuff. Two, it had only limited frontal coverage and very little, if damn near any, vertical coverage, so attacks from above were still effective. And three, it fired 107mm buckshot. It would wipe out anything in a cone in front of the launcher, including Soviet close support infantry. <laughs> Which you really should kind of expect the designers to have seen coming, you know, with a 107mm shotgun and all, but uh, oh well, details. And still again, for a first try, it was pretty impressive, and had the Soviet Union continued its research on hard kill systems, they might well have had something amazing today. But instead, due to various disarmament treaties and clauses, they shifted their focus onto soft kill systems. You've probably seen those um, weird ass eye things on the T-90 tank. Those are infrared jammers, intended to confuse a rocket's guidance and lock-on systems. The Russians claim they work just fine, but 
Mm, seeing as heavy casualties during the Chechen war caused them to start work on the arena system, well, it seems that uh, they thought they needed something a little extra. The arena functions by using a Doppler multipurpose radar to identify the incoming missile and figure out its speed and direction by bouncing radar waves off it. The system can be turned on and off at the tank commander's discretion, since radar waves are easily detectable and could give away the tank's position. In addition to the radar, Arena also possesses a digital camera system that keeps a constant picture of the tank's surroundings. This allows it to differentiate between various projectiles, so it will shoot at an ATGM, but will leave the wee birdies humming around it alone. It also allows it to track and classify several targets simultaneously, so weapons that look like they are going to miss will be ignored whilst those that look like hits will be classified and a hard kill countermeasure will be allocated to each one from a total capacity of 26 countermeasures. These are launched upwards and away from the tank and then detonate sending a cloud of micro projectiles down in a protective curtain to destroy the missile. The steep angle also helps protect nearby infantry, as the intercept rounds are pointed downwards at an angle rather than straight away like with the Drost. The system has a minimum range of 50 meters, so anything fired at it outside the 50 meters should be detected and intercepted in a 300 degree cone to the tank's front. And the final kill of the projectile should happen one and a half meters away from the tank, plenty of space to disperse the jet or any explosive effect. Finally, the arena is claimed to be able to handle projectiles moving at up to 700 meters per second, which is more than enough to deal with any ATGM currently in service, but like all current hard kill systems can not deal with solid ammunition like say a uh, tank shell for example, as those can travel well in excess of a thousand meters per second. On paper, therefore, the system looks pretty damn great, and potentially, in combination with other soft kill countermeasures and the hard kill countermeasure of the reactive armor, should increase a tank's chances of surviving an ATGM attack quite substantially. And at a relatively low price point of $300,000 as well, as far as high-tech missile interception systems, that's quite cheap. Its effectiveness, however, remains unproven. Oh, there are videos of it, absolutely, as I have been showing you, but to date, I do not believe the arena has been in active combat, which is quite puzzling, really. If it is as good as it is claimed to be, then it would have been a tremendous help in Ukraine. The end law, for example, is well, well, well within the arena's parameters, and it claims to be able to intercept top attack weapons like the Javelin as well, though I have yet to find any test footage demonstrating this alleged capability. But there is a system that has been deployed in active combat and proven very successful, the Israeli Trophy System. It was first installed on Merkava 4 tanks in 2010, and during Operation Protective Edge or the 2014 Gaza War depending on who you ask, the trophy successfully intercepted dozens of anti-tank guided missile and RPG attacks. In fact, the IDF claim a 100% success rate for the trophy system during that conflict. Now, a 100% uh, success rate in anything makes me highly skeptical, and it should be said that the trophy was dealing with mostly old RPGs and AT gems used by poorly trained militias, not cutting edge end laws and javelins used by hyper paranoid and highly trained regulars. So. In a full-blown parity or near parity conflict, we can't say for sure the trophy would perform as well and effective though it appears to be, it does come at a hefty cost, uh, $900,000 per tank. So long as it works, of course, it is worth it to protect a $4 million tank, but the argument can absolutely be made, and I see it, oh I see it, that making a $4 million tank into a $5 million tank and then see it explode nevertheless would suck quite a bit. 
And that is also one of the main arguments against the current validity of the tank. Slapping a million dollar upgrade on obsolete Hulk is merely reinforcing failure. However, bear in mind that most of these systems are, in military terms, babies, barely a decade old. We can expect them to get a lot better, and if Trophy is already claiming tremendous success for the Israeli Defense Force, the time may well come when current ATGMs will be the ones being rendered obsolete. That is, until they start firing clouds of micro-projectiles, tiny little self-guided bombers to overwhelm the limited intercept capacity of a hard-kill system, and then the defenses will evolve again and so forth and so on as the sword and the shield continue an eternal competition. And who knows, maybe I will get my enormous rolling death fortresses someday, with banks of laser projectors that zap each and every single little bomblet out of the sky in brilliant red flashes. But for now, we're gonna have to make do with radar-guided shotguns. Which is a compromise I can live with. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.